I'll make a start. Thank you all for coming. Great to be here. Um, I'm Barry Duncan. I'm going to be talking to you about our embedded electronic software company based in Auckland. Um, some of the tools that we've developed over the years. Uh, we have a small team, eight, eight, eight of us in Auckland, um, doing a whole range of um, embedded product development for other companies around. So let's get into it. Okay, so these are some of the topics I'll be going over. Go over the company background um, and some of the tools that we've developed. Um, hopefully at the end we'll get some time to log into our server in Auckland and we'll be able to see some of the tests that are running in our lab as well. So you can see how that's all being automated. Okay, so our company, we started in Christchurch. Um, after the earthquake we decided to move it up to Auckland. Um, we were right in the middle of the CBD, so it wasn't the best place to hang around. Um, our company's focus is really on quality. Um, my background, I used to work at Schneider Electric in Australia. Um, they produce all the light switches that you'll see around the place. Um, they produce millions of products all around the world, French company. Um, while working there, the, the, biggest, uh, the, the biggest attribute to the company was the quality and focusing on that for high volume production. So we've taken that and applied that to lots of other companies all through New Zealand and all around the world now. Uh, these are some of our customers. So since quitting work, working for Schneider Electric, I, they're still one of our biggest customers. So we do work for them still for automating parts of the power grid. Uh, but yeah, these are some of the other companies we help out. Uh, so Schneider Electric, this is one of the products that they develop. It's a recloser for medium voltage power distribution systems. Um, so as you can imagine, operating on 33,000 volts can be quite dangerous. Um, having software and hardware that works very reliably is super important. It's critical. Um, people will die if things don't operate correctly. So, um, so quality is really a big, big focus for all their products. Um, so in this case, this is a linesman operating a fuse, closing a fuse onto a cable fault, and it's exploding on him. Um, just to give you an idea of some of the things that the poor linesmen have to deal with just to keep the lights on. Uh, some other industries that we get involved in, motor controllers. Um, on the right hand side, I actually brought one of those. Um, it's a little device that we've developed, a motor coil that goes, uh, goes onto that. Um, we'll talk more about that. We ended up doing whole simulations for that and we decided to use Python for that, of course. <laughs> um, and there's a washing machine controller on the left there. Uh, flight control systems, so as you can imagine, flight control systems are extremely complicated and quality is obviously utmost importance. Um, lots and lots of control systems all working together, automation, autopilots, um, guidance systems, all sorts of yeah, electronics and embedded software um, to control the flights. Redundancy is key as well, making sure things work reliably. Um, so we've only helped with some, some small parts of that. Um, there's obviously massive teams all around the world um, doing the full flight control system. We, we went to Spain to help audit a company in Spain. Um, generally, the types of things that we get involved in, um, anything to do with the development process really, any sort of research, something um, that any of the core teams like Schneider Electric, they'll be doing a lot of R&D already and they'll have a problem that they just want someone else to help with. So we can just help them with small, small problems. Um, or they could be quite big problems as well that we get involved with as well. But um, yeah, something where we can overlook some of the engineers. These are normally big teams of engineers all around the world, um, multinational teams. Um, we'll go and help them do um, parts of the problem to, to make things work better, more reliable. Um, so today what I'll talk to you about is the three main areas where we've managed to get Python involved. Um, yeah, simulators um, for motor controllers is one of the big ones. Um, code generators, so we'd rather do, write, write um, in high level languages. Um, writing in C is not always the best choice for some of the problems that we need to solve. 
So being able to write in a high level language like Python to generate some of the C code for us, that can save a lot of time, make things a lot easier to do as well. Um, and we'll go into automation testing. So we've got a lab up in Auckland with a big warehouse with a whole racks of equipment running automation tests. Um, capturing, yeah, lots of data. That, that's the key with quality as well is, um, I don't know if anyone's familiar with Six Sigma, the process improvement concept of measuring the data is key and being able to analyze that data. So if you don't measure it, you don't know where you are, you're just guessing. Okay, so simulations. We used to use MATLAB a while ago um, for some of our motor control um, simulations. We developed a new motor controller for one of our clients. Um, we had some issues with MATLAB. We wanted to expand it to, it worked really good for our, the original use case of what we we're trying to achieve. It worked perfect. But then when we tried to take that and we needed to understand how the matrix transformations were happening, we needed to understand how some of the proprietary code inside MATLAB was solving the differential equations and we couldn't break the barrier and get into all the details that we needed. And so we did this new motor controller for another client of ours and we decided to use Python. <laughs> And it was a bit of a bold move. Um, so we, we went back to first principles and we simulated all the magnetic fields, we simulated the mechanics, we simulated all the electrics of it. Uh, we simulated a control system to try and see how do we actually gonna control this motor. Um, and it turned out to be a yeah, real, real good experience using Python. Um, the process for, well, actually, why, why us create, uh, do simulations? Um, I think the biggest reason for me is it's really enjoyable. Getting into the mathematics, I, I really like that side of it. It's a technical challenge, um, and I learned a huge amount as well. It's, it's really valuable being able to understand actually really what's happening inside the system. Uh, the process for creating, creating any model um, is a lot of uh, first principle physics is what it comes down to mostly. And then a lot of experimentation to see, well, does this work? Um, and trying to work out what are all the parameters involved um, in the system. And then tuning it to try and match reality, actually doing real life experiments as well and seeing, well, can we match reality? It's no, the model's useless if it doesn't actually predict what's actually gonna happen, so. Um, and then we can use it once it's, once it's good enough. It's never always perfect. Um, and you don't always need to get perfect as well. It depends on what you're trying to achieve. For us, it was trying to work out what the control system would be for this new motor controller. Um, and yeah, we, we were able to achieve that by, by the simulator that we, we generated. Uh, these are some of the packages in Python that we used. NumPy, obviously very, very useful package for doing all sorts of mathematics. Um, yeah, SciPy for doing sort of interpolation type functions. Um, we had some magnetic fields that we needed um, to do some sort of curve fitting. Um, so we used SciPy for that. Uh, Pandas for doing a whole lot of the data access. So storing um, all their experiments into databases. So we use um, that for all our automation tests as well, not just for the simulation side. And all our instrumentation that we have in our lab, we can store data into formats that pandas can open up. Uh, matplotlib, great for plotting everything. Uh, and the key one for us is number, which I don't know if, has anyone heard of that? Is that, yeah, some people heard of that. Um, it allows you to optimize um, a lot of the code and convert it into C code effectively. So you can just put declarators around classes and it converts those classes into C code kind of behind the scenes. You don't really need to worry about it. It was actually, yeah, I, I wrote the entire code without thinking about number, and then I just added the declarators around everything, and with a little bit of tweaking, I got it to yeah, improve the performance about 10 times faster, I think, overall. So, yeah, the simulations, are, it, it's, it's good if the simulation doesn't take all day to run, obviously. If it, if it takes a minute, that's really, really great. Uh, the components of the simulation, um, yeah, so most of it is related to first principle physics. Um, so the differential equation of the current versus voltage of an inductor, for example, would be part of the electrical model. Um, magnetic model, we simplified as much as we could because we didn't really need all the 3D magnetic fluxes and understand that. We're just dealing with something that's spinning around. So um, yeah, we don't need to know all the details. And that's the, the good thing, which I think MATLAB, if you were to use some of the the modules as well, or Simulink, if you were to use some of those modules, it would try to simulate a lot more than perhaps you need. 
And that was one of the things that, that one of the troubles we had with our previous experience using MATLAB is that some of the switching transients or some of the what was going on, which may have actually been correct inside the electrical system that we were simulating at the time with MATLAB, it didn't need to simulate some of those things. And it was struggling because it was trying to simulate a perfect simulation and we didn't need that. So with by writing it all yourself, you can tell it, well, we don't care about that. We'll just skip on, do the next thing. So that's one of the advantages of you know, writing your own simulation tool. Um, so basically there was lots of experiments that went on. So as part of the system, we need to work out, well, what's the inertia of the load? What's, um, what's the coil properties? What's the magnetic fields? How, how, how is the system responding to the signals that we're putting in? So there's just a couple of photos. It's, yeah, there's lots and lots of stuff that we've obviously captured, but just to give you an idea, on the left is a dyno rig. Um, so that can allow us to, it's got an encoder on the right and on the left it's got a programmable load so we can load up the motor under different scenarios. Um, in the middle we've got, it's measuring the magnetic field and the way the magnetic field gets um, saturated um, inside the, the core, um, the laminations, um, which has some weird and wonderful plots. So the, what's analyzed below, so the, these um, scope captures in the middle top, they go into some Python code and that would do some analysis for us to work out, well, what's actually happening with the magnetic fields um, in two dimensions. So we, we skipped the third dimension, we weren't interested in that. Um, and then on the right hand side, so after lots of work that's done on the, on the left end plus lots of other stuff, on the right uh, shows some actual versus simulated. So this is the end result, this is what we're aiming for. So um, the top one shows at a different load point to the bottom one, so two different load points, the motor's spinning around, the control system's all running, and it's really hard to see, but basically there's squiggly lines which is real data and the straight lines are simulated data. And yeah, on, on the squiggly lines, the straight lines are there. So. The simulations is matching reality, and again, it's not perfect. It's um, yeah, you, you know things aren't perfect when you break some certain laws of physics as well. So, <laughs> um, but yeah, these ones we we didn't break too many laws of physics. So it's okay. Um, so based on those time series simulations, what we're able to achieve as well, all those tiny dots on the left is a single time series simulation. And then what we can do is we can run millions of those time series simulation with the number. When, when we first did this, we did it all just pure Python, no number package. Um, but yeah, it was too slow. And then what, once it does the, the compile for one of those dots, um, the compile's done. And then you can just run that simulator over and over and over again, changing the parameters, and it's super fast. Really, really fast to simulate all that. So yeah, so that's... And yeah, again, the, the other beauty of simulations, another point that's good to raise is you can simulate things that are not physically possible. So anywhere that's off the highlighted in yellow, um, anything off that, you would probably end up with molten circuit board on the floor. Um, so, and that's what, on the right-hand side, this is reality, what we're actually measuring as well versus the simulation, which, yeah, what we're really aiming for is trying to find a linear trend um, that's, that's our whole purpose, so that we can put that into PID control loops to be able to control the, the magnetic field as the motor spins around and all, everything stay in sync. So that, it's like trying to balance, you know, something on your finger. It's not, well, I'm probably not going to be able to do it, but it's quite a hard control system to run. You have to constantly adjust to hold it upright. So that's what our control system has to do. So if it moves slightly off one side, it brings it back. And that's what the PID control system does inside the motor, lets everything stay in control. Okay, so that's uh, simulators. Um, code generators, so this is another area that we use Python. Um, this is since very, very early on in our company, we've always had code generators. We, we actually used to use Perl um, as a programming language for our code generators. Um, but a client once asked us, can you just use Python, please? And we used to use XML, and he said, can we please use JSON? So we swapped over to that and haven't looked back, to be honest, it's, um, that's what we use for everyone now. Um, so it was a really, really good choice. Um, so yeah, so what we use that for is products like a bar refrigeration controller, this type of thing. Um, it will have a user interface on it. 
um, and that could be translated into multiple languages. And you would define all that data and the user interface, the passwords required, all of the, the control through the user interface all in a JSON high-level format. Um, you don't really want to define that all in C. That would be a horrible idea. Um, and then you use Python to generate all the C code. So what that meant was we developed what we thought was a great user interface, and the client didn't quite agree. They, they wanted something a bit different. So they rewrote the JSON files and regenerated the code, and everything just worked. So this is great. You, know, you can define in a language that's suitable. You don't want to define stuff in C. So. Um, so that C code, that's used for not just the user interface, but also databases and event systems as well. Um, and then the reason there's a motor on the side, this refrigeration controller talks to a, a motor, and inside a bar you have evaporator fan, condenser fan. Um, there's databases that are stored inside the motors as well, so it's all the same, same generators that are used for those. Um, and the, yeah, the key advantage really is the low memory usage. It's, it's, it generates static code in, in C, which is very, very efficient. It's every bit you've sort of calculated exactly what's going to go on when you write the Python code so that it really does, it, it, every bit counts. And this is on really high volume products, so there's over a million of these motors manufactured. Um, so having cheap um, electronics that have uh, small memory is um, key for the success of the product. Um, and our big, our big topic, um, probably more code, more effort goes into this than anything else is our automation testing. And what I'll do, because of the time, so we, are, we have these six hour schedules, and I'll, um, before midday, I'll show you our Jenkins, because um, I don't want to show you when all these jobs are, oh, oh, that didn't go on the right screen, sorry. <laughs> Is that? Uh, yeah, so, so basically Jenkins is a continuous integration system. Hands up if you've used Jenkins before. Yay, everyone's using Jenkins, great. Um, it's an amazing tool. It can allow you to do lots and lots of um, things that would tear your hair out if you tried to do it manually, I guess. Um, and yeah, I wanted to show you this here now just so that you could see so we've got all these Raspberry Pis. Um, so we've got a, a server that delegates jobs to nodes, uh, Jenkins nodes, and there's lots of Raspberry Pis that do all different jobs, basically. So you can see them all running there. You've got some different, different devices running tests, um, and you could click on any of these. You could see who generated, who, who started the job. You can see different problems that it's automatically detecting for us. So this is running on real devices, real hardware. Um, you can click on. It, it, it handles all the um, exclusiv exclusivity um, requirements as well. So if there's multiple devices, you want to schedule firmware loads, you want to schedule configuration changes, um, you want to schedule different types of tests. It just manages all that for you, which is great. There's, yeah, there's lots of plugins. Uh, sorry, I know the talk's not about... <laughs> <laughs> um, not meant to be about this, but in the back, in, underneath it all is Python. So this here is written in Java, I believe. Um, and then underneath all of this here, it executes our Python code and it reports all the data back so that we can do pretty plots and things. Anyhow, I thought I'd just show you that just before. It was actually right on my last slide, but I realize now that it's um, because of the timing of all our scripts. I'll show it to you when there's bars actually doing something. Okay. Cool, so that's uh, Jenkins. Um, it can build all our code, it can load all our code, it can, yeah, store, every test that runs gets stored into a database. Um, so everything's recorded. Who ran the test? Um, was it a person? Was it a machine that had a dependency job that needed to run? Um, and then analysis is run both live on our devices, so all our devices record data live, um, but then also, there's analysis that happens once a day, so anything we might have missed, anything that could be better detected externally outside of the microcontroller, that gets detected as well, ran every day. Um, these are some of the Python packages that we used. Uh, Pi Serial, great. Pi Modbus, it's great. VXI, um, there's an LXI interface for instrumentation, which is really good, so any sort of power supplies or scopes or 
spectrum analyzers, whatever, you can interface it to Python using that package. Um, and then we use pandas for storing all the data and then also to retrieve the data, obviously. We use HDF5 um, high definition format, binary storage format, which allows us to use yeah, two terabytes of Synology boxes and store huge millions and millions and millions of test results. It's, um, yeah, it's a humongous amount of volume of test data we've got. Uh, we do lots of processing in NumPy again and JUnit XML is a recent addition that we just added, so that allows us to while the test is running, we generate a XML document so that we can plot all the results as well. So that is, starts to complete the loop. We, we didn't have that there for a while, and yeah, we just added that in so that you can, yeah, it, it's not really designed for this, obviously. This JUnit is designed for unit testing. Um, but yeah, we've sort of adapted it to make it fit in with the system that we're using. Um, since there were so many hands, I guess I don't need to go through any benefits. It's, um, yeah, it's mo most definitely well worth the effort. Um, if anyone hasn't used Jenkins, I would recommend having a bit of a look. Um, it's, it's really, really useful. Yeah, the, one of the things, that middle one, the live experiments, that was really good just the other day. A colleague of mine, he was doing an experiment and he had some unusual behavior and he sent me the link of the Jenkins job that was running. I opened the link and I could see exactly the experiment he was running. Like trying to do that any other way, I, you know, it would be difficult to be able to share results that easily. And I could yeah, see all the, all the logs that Python was generating. Yeah, and then being able to just <laughs> know repeated mistakes as well. You, you learn from a mistake and you update the code in Git and it's gonna run the next time. It's no brainer. Um, when to automate tasks, um, sometimes it doesn't make sense to automate, it's like um, if you have a saving of only a tiny amount and it's going to take a lot longer to develop, well obviously don't do that, but there's a lot of good candidates for jobs. For example, our, we might do five builds of firmware a day and that takes between five minutes and 30 minutes say to do that, it runs all the unit tests, it does all sorts of um, checks and balances. Um, it tags automatically in Git. It, yeah, does all sorts of things automatically. And so the saving of that over five years is four weeks of solid working. And maybe it takes half an hour to write that script. So why wouldn't you automate it? That's, that's the, the idea. But yeah, there's, you've got to be careful. You don't want to spend, because it can be a rabbit hole, you just go down and do automate everything. Um, yeah, you, there are, you need to, do a sanity check against something like this to make sure you're actually going to get a payback. Uh, here's some photos. Uh, so these are all uh, this circuit board inside motors, um, controlling the motor now using all the information we learned from the simulations. Um, they all have Bluetooth connected to them. Um, Bluetooth talks to Raspberry Pis. We have redundant Raspberry Pis which I probably wasn't clear when I showed you before, but there was multiple Raspberry Pis per project, and then if one of them goes down, it can always talk via another Raspberry Pi. Um, so yeah, redundancy and testing is good. And these are all scheduled automatically, so while I'm away or whatever, it will start up doing things. And then we've got some jobs that are in our office, not just in our, um, the warehouse as well, and some of those Raspberry Pis, we just schedule them so they run at night only because um, we don't want fans making heaps of noise in the office during the day when we're working, or during the weekend like now, they'll be running as well, constantly. Um, so that's all easy to configure in Jenkins. Uh, so our method of mounting, um, Raspberry Pi just glued to the wall. <laughs> <laughs> uh, pretty sophisticated stuff. Um, in the middle there, there's an oven uh, modified with a controller on it and a freezer with its thermostat modified as well and go down to minus 35, put some electronics in there. Um, there's a rack of products for an American client of ours. Um, it's for hotel air conditioning systems. Um, so there are, yeah, there's eight fans, all different types of fan loads. There's a book taped to one of the fans just to block off the airflow to test a different situation. Um, yeah, and there's a computer, this one here has a computer controlling it rather than a Raspberry Pi. Raspberry Pis do have their limitations that if you try and stream huge amounts of data, you can um, run out of processing power. It gets a, gets a bit of a struggle. Um, so yeah, so this one's running a, a server to communicate to eight devices. 
Um, and yeah, we've got programmable power supplies and things as well. So we can try US supply and that's all controlled through Python as well. Okay, summary. Um, so yeah, I guess using Python has helped us a lot over the years is really the summary of all of that. Um, yeah, there's, there's, there's other ways of doing things most definitely. Like for automation testing, you could use other products like National Instruments LabVIEW. Um, but LabVIEW has its problems as well and using Python, you can do version control a lot easier. Um, and there's, there's such a big array of support that you can get now as well. There's just so many packages that can do so much. Um, and trying to, I think some of the proprietary methods now are trying to catch up. Like I think it's most definitely the other way around where using Python would most definitely be the preferred choice. Um, and yeah, there's, if you structure the code nicely, it can be very usable for other people, other engineers as well. Um, so yeah, so one of our lessons probably is um, up front, spending a bit of effort on it and making sure you structure things correctly um, so it's easier to expand on. Um, cool, okay, I think that's me. Um, is there any questions or anything you guys wanna see? Um, I could run some Python code or do something. <laughs> <laughs> Floor's open, yes? Are you actually pushing MicroPython? No, no, we don't use MicroPython. Ah, I see, sorry. Um, do any of our micros use MicroPython? No, no, they don't. Um, our, micro, our micros are very cheap. Um, these micros wouldn't be capable of running MicroPython, unfortunately. Um, so these micros use a mass production, uh, 10 cents, 30 cents, that type of price range. Um, so yeah, so that's why using Python as a code generator, say, is a really good idea. Uh, but trying to run Python actually natively on, on one of these micros, um, yeah, it would struggle to fit in the few K we have spare. So. <laughs> um, any other questions? Yep. As a uh, test executive for your production test, do you use Python as a test executive or Jenkins as the, the test executive? So Jenkins is controlling when all the tests run. Yeah. Um, we sometimes will run tests manually on our own uh, computer as well. So quite often we'll be developing a test or trying something very unusual, and we don't really want to share those results because then my analysis will be like, oh, there's all these problems here, but really it was me just playing around with something stupid. So, um, yeah, so different, different use cases depending on what you want to do, but yeah, I, I think we, we were doing Python tests just manually originally, but it just got so out of hand when we had, like we used to have 20 of these motors and we captured 30 million tests and trying to do that manually, control the tests manually, was just ridiculous. So using Jenkins to sort out all the, um, what the devices, what the resources were in the room, um, how the resources interlinked to each other, what power supply was controlling which device, all of that, automating it was just a no-brainer. Yeah. Any other questions? Yep. Uh, <laughs> okay, Python 2 or Python 3. Um, a little bit embarrassing. Um, we use Python 3 for anything new. Um, <laughs> I, just, I just picked this up. Um, RIP Python 2, 2000 to 2020, so I've got a year. <laughs> um, yeah, there's, there's some of our code generators which are still Python 2. I haven't had a need to update them, which I most definitely need to do that. Um, and our automation tests, all our simulations are all Python 3, and that was, that wasn't by choice either. That was by, there was a package I needed to use. I really wanted to use this package and it worked in Python 3 great. And I tried to get it to work in Python 2 and I just couldn't, couldn't pull it off. So yeah, so I, I ended up um, using Python 3 for anything new. Any, anything that's, any new code that we develop, I make sure that it was compatible for Python 2. But there's a, there's a few, um, some of our engineers have been creative in some of their code and uh, yeah, trying to port all that over to Python 3 is going to be a challenge, so we'll, we'll work on that soon. Great question. In, yep, uh, here, sorry. Can you elaborate on how you have the Raspberry Pi redundancy set up? Uh, yeah, so what... Uh, yes, <laughs> and I'm forgetting this, yeah, thanks for the job. Um, okay, so how do we do uh, redundancy with Raspberry Pis? So, what we do is on the Raspberry Pis, they're paired to lots of Bluetooth devices. So we effectively, all the different Raspberry Pis will be paired to the same devices. 
Um, and then what we can do is, if it's, it's not completely automated, so if a Raspberry Pi does go down, it's a real simple switch in Git, we push that configuration up and it will use the new Raspberry Pi for running those jobs. So yeah, so we haven't automated it 100%, but yeah, we haven't really had a massive use case for, well, we do get Raspberry Pis failing occasionally, but yeah, not, not that common, so. Uh, yeah, behind, you had a question as well. Um, okay, so was there anything we've developed that could be shared with the community? It's a really good question as well. I, I think it's all these, it's actually not that hard to link all these modules together. So it may sound like something quite complicated, but all the open source uh, packages that do everything are already um, in the community. So Pandas, you just open a database and you start writing to it. Um, Pi Serial, if you know the protocol you need to support. So I can't obviously yeah, publish all the protocols that we use for all the pro products that we develop. Um, but yeah, I mean Modbus, for example, that's been used more and more by embedded devices as well. So you just use the Pi Modbus package to access that. Um, there's a lot of packages already out there, I guess is the point, that already do 90% of the work. It's just a case of plugging it, them all together for your use case that you have. Um, but yeah, I, I think, well that's why I'm presenting as well, I guess is trying to share this knowledge, is that show that it is actually possible to do this and some of the things that we learn. And like JUnit, like that's an unusual use case of JUnit. And when I was searching and trying to figure out, well how do I get this data back in Jenkins so I can see a graphical representation of everything, um, I couldn't really find anything that was easy to do. But yeah, using JUnit you can um, create an XML file as the test runs or after the test runs and it can plot all the data and all the different failure modes that it detects, so, yeah. Uh, any other questions? Oh, yeah, sorry. Um, so, moving to Jenkins, you stopped spending your time on running the test and now you spend your time on administrating your nodes and hardware and in your case it's not just the server run, right? You have got lots of hardware motors and tools yeah. Yeah. Uh, can you talk about that, that maintenance and how much time you okay. on it? So, so the question is about, um, now that we've got so much free time, yay. <laughs> <laughs> um, the maintenance side of it, how much time do we spend on maintenance? Um, it's, it's always ongoing because we're always developing new firmware. So one of the biggest things that we're doing is we're constantly releasing software for our customers' products. and all those new firmwares, a lot of it will be just re-validated by the same scripts, so we won't need to maintain a lot of that. Um, there's not a huge amount of failures of the actual um, test system itself. Um, occasionally, like we've got some tests that, that I mean, the, the tests are designed to break stuff, that's the purpose of testing, right? Why test if you're not gonna break something? So some of the tests will wear out products quite easily as well. So if we're not careful with how much testing we do or a particular type of testing, we'll burn the flash memory, for example, because we've just done way too many sector swaps. Um, so we've, yeah, so these, some of these, um, yeah, I, I assume that's kind of public information. So some of those um, chips, they are rated for 10,000 flash cycles, say. Um, we test over a million. So, um, and we normally get failures only after a million cycles. So that's sort of, yeah, where, where things are at. Um, does that answer your question? <laughs> Any other questions? Anyone want to see anything else on the, um, I'm not sure if I had to reboot my computer before or not. Um, this is, this is an example. So all our, all our test results get stored in databases. Normally it goes into um, Synology drives which store everything. Um, and then, I have got it on the right screen. Um, so we've set up uh, scripts so that we can just go like this. This will run some Python code uh, on the wrong window again. Uh. Yeah, I'll drag it up in a sec, sorry guys. <laughs> it's just, so it, it, this data contains six hours of test results. Um, so that you get data like this, or, or th there's a there's a real boring one here. This is this is showing nothing went <laughs> nothing went wrong, guys. It's all okay here. <laughs> um, no faults. So there, it started with three faults at the start of zero seconds. Twenty thousand seconds later, there's still three faults. So so that's okay. Um, yeah, the the, the data is a wee bit hard to read. This is a test which um, is testing the stability of the control loop. So I can zoom into some of the data. Um, this is showing the speed. 
Uh, let's zoom in on that. Um, this is doing different step changes in uh, some of the control systems. Um, yeah, there, there's two PID control loops running on this. Well, there's lots of PID control loops, but two of them are to do with the motor control. So there's uh, an on time and a dead time, and those vary to, um, to go to new different load points for the motor. So here we're changing the load point of the motor and checking that the response of the control systems correctly. Um, which is, by the way, is like, you know, balancing this and then moving over here, balancing it, moving over here, it's controlling all of that and no failures. So that's, and that's all based on the simulations that we wrote. Um, and then things like this, this is changing the power level. Um, I know this is only one type of test. So you can see the step response is there. So it's requesting different levels and ramping up and down and doing different things. Um, yeah. Uh, and then, yeah, from all these tests, this is just one type of test. There's a startup test which is constantly, I oh know, and there's different types of fans. So, in part of the Python code, it will say what the device is. So, it's got timestamp, obviously, what the script is, what the unit is that it ran the job on, and the fan type. So, 154 is 154 millimeter fan blade and 34 degree pitch on the fan blade. So, it, it it's testing all different types of combinations. And again, if I plot that data, that should be a short one, it's only a small file. So yeah, 12 megabytes for six hours of test results as well. Um, oh, it's on the wrong screen. Uh, I'll do another one, that one's not, not that interesting. Um, encoder means it's got an encoder on it as well. Uh, let's do it. Yeah, when you've got five hours of data, it um, takes a little while to plot. Um, so again, this is, oh. yeah, so this is um, stopping and starting the motor. The, um, the green line is the control system, how much error it measures, um, and nice flat lines, so the on time, dead time, the nice flat lines, which means it's all nice and stable when it's running. Um, so there's a whole lot of error when the control system first starts up. It has to try and find where the magnetic field is as it's spinning around. Once it's found it, it sort of locks onto that. It's kind of like a phase lock loop. Um, and then there's an encoder, which in this case, this is just part of the measurement um, system. It's just proving that we are actually spinning correctly. It's not used for the control system at all. So um, that's just a nice sanity check that we have on some of the motors. We put an encoder on just to prove it's doing the right thing. Um, yeah, I'm not sure, was there any other questions? No? Yep? Well, I got this question the other day, and I think potentially, yes. Uh, <laughs> artificial intelligence, um, can AI be applied to this um, large subset of data? And I think, because there's so much data, yeah, why not? It makes a lot of sense. And I mean, the control system we came up from the simulations is probably not the optimal um, control system for it. It had a nice linear range and it's stable. It balances everything really nicely. And we've been pretty aggressive to it as well. Make sure we do big step responses, everything recovers correctly. Um, but that's not to say it's the optimal solution. Um, this is for proof of concept, by the way. So this product is not yet out the door. It's um, something that will be released very soon. Um, so yeah, so it's, I think going forward, if we were wanting to optimize this, this needs to get customer trials and prove that it's um, got a, it's actually feasible in the marketplace, um, which I believe it is. It's, it's gonna be one of the best small motor controllers that is around, um, much more efficient than any of the competition, basically. Um, and yeah, I think this, yeah, it, it, you could use AI with this amount of data, so. Anything else? Looks like I've got four minutes left. Yeah. So you have any problems with scale engines? Like are you looking towards something like a containerized workflow or like a different or something like that? I haven't, uh, so containerizing and expanding for the uh, scalability of Jenkins is the question. Um, we have only just gone, well, a few years ago, we went to doing <coughs> nodes, so using the Raspberry Pis with nodes, which that's our scale up approach, I guess. Um, we couldn't run a lot of this in the cloud because a lot of it does need to talk to devices live and we do need that high response rate to be able to get all that data out. Um, some of the analysis we potentially could put in the cloud, but we really don't care. It's so slow, like it, 
there's, there's a lot of data, but we can process that within an hour of CPU usage overnight. So, um, yeah, there's, there's not really a need at the moment to, to go into the cloud or to scale up into much bigger amounts. We, we do run the system on cloud, client sites as well, so some of our clients do use our system as well. So I've got another question there. Uh, yes. Uh, so, do we do any testing for manufacturing or just for the design phase? So, this is all design phase testing. Um, there is. Uh, how do I remove that? Remove that. Remove that. Too many. Uh, so, this uh, device on the right is for in production. So. It's got Python running in there as well. It tests the motors. Every single motor that gets made, it gets tested, check the efficiency of the motor. Um, so this product, there's over a million of those ones um, already been made. Um, and yeah, it's slightly different Python, but yeah, same, same concepts and all of that as well. It, yeah, we came on board with that project a little bit later, so we didn't quite get the chance to put all the same features that we would have liked to put in it. Anything else? All right, very good. Oh, thank you guys. Appreciate it.